Welcome everybody. And um, no, it's not Laura. Laura is stuck at the Denver airport, but I actually think she just didn't want to have to pronounce musculoskeletal system. So, <laughs> so you've got me as your surprise host today. This is Brenda. And of course we're on with Dr. Stephanie Lamb this week Hello. and um, looking to have a lot of fun. For those of you that were with us last month for the birthday party, yay. Um, that was so much fun with Arroyo and Dr. Lamb has a video of um, Arroyo having fun at home with all of his little friends and, and continuing the party at home that afternoon. So we're going to yeah. let her show that. So I'll show you guys the video. I'm going to share my screen um, and you'll first see just a whole bunch of pictures of, of uh, Arroyo and his birthday party. Um, but then I'll show the video for you where he and his friends were enjoying the fun uh, festivities of getting to eat their Faber's cake here. So um, here's a little video I have of them. Hopefully it'll start showing. Hmm. I'm not seeing anything on my end. I was looking at it just a second ago. Maybe it's just because I'm screen sharing. It's being a little funny for us now. There we go. Okay, here we got it. So here's that fabulous cake that we showed you guys the last time that LeFevers had made for Arroyo for his birthday. Um, it was way too big for him to eat it all on his own during the, during the day at the office. So instead, I, I brought it home um, and had a little birthday party with his friends. So that's Maureen, one of my African greys. I have two African greys, but um, Maureen was very happy to enjoy the cake with Arroyo. And you can see them there just... Uh, being really good um, and sharing that with no problems. Um, and then in the background, you'll see my Maka Ima, um, who is also a part of the party. But I had her kind of sitting off in the back with her own little section of the cake, just because, you know, she's a little bit bigger and she sometimes likes to bully the others out of the way, whereas uh, Maureen and Arroyo can get along together just fine and sit next to each other and they tend to not um, bully each other or cause any problems. Maureen or Ima, the macaw, sometimes she just, you know, throws her weight around a little bit more um, and will kind of try to scare the other guys off. So she had to be off in the in the distance for the, the party, but still close enough to enjoy and, and be a part of the family and still do that foraging behavior um, that you would see these guys doing in the wild, you know, in the wild when they're out there uh, eating everything they often eat in these little groups and stuff. So it's kind of a very similar, um, a similar experience that I'm trying to uh, provide in captivity for them that, hey, we eat as a family together. It's safer in numbers, that sort of thing. And I do think they really enjoy it like that. Um, but Thanks again for making us that great cake because I really think they all appreciated it. And it lasted us for uh, probably about a week. I gave it to my other African gray as well. My, my green cheek conure and my finches um, enjoyed it too. And actually even my chicken got a little bit of the little pieces that they had thrown on, on the ground. So I'm going to um, stop sharing for just one second. I'm going to swap off of this video. And so speaking of your birds being outside, don't you have as a kind of a backup? I've seen some netting that you have, right? Yeah. Oh, so yeah, they uh, I have netting in half of my backyard is, is covered in bird netting um, so that I can safely take them outside. And um, several so a couple of them are clipped, but a few, several of them aren't clipped. So if they want to fly back there, it's like enclosed and we're safe. Um, and then also just so nothing's getting in there as well, you know, that we're not having any um, other out outside birds like getting into the backyard so that there's not like any direct contact um, with wild birds. Certainly a wild bird can fly over. Um, I have birds, wild birds land on my roof and kind of look down into the yard and see what's going on in there, um, but no no direct contact. So trying to keep it safe and, and separated, but allow them to get outside and get that natural UV light exposure, which is really, really, I think, important on, on many levels. Um, so, and then they also kind of will sometimes climb down and walk around on the ground and forage off of stuff that they, they dropped. And so, um, uh, it's a it's a fun little area for them I think and that's an excellent point of nothing getting in because those predatory birds can come from nowhere 
absolutely. And you know, what's interesting is um, Arroyo is very good about watching the skies for things. Not nobody else's, like none of my other birds really pay attention too much about what's going on around them. But Arroyo is actually very good about paying attention to what's going on around. So if I see him suddenly stop and be like looking up at something, then I go check it out and find out what it is. And there have been times where there's been a bird, you know, a raptor of some sort. Again, we're enclosed, so we're safe. But sometimes it's something goofy, um, like maybe it's an airplane going by. Or there's been <laughs> several times where he's uh, observed those mylar balloons, like a, a balloon floating by <laughs> that must have escaped from somewhere. But he doesn't know what it is. And so he just sits there and watches it for a while. So he's he's kind of my little, my lookout out of, of everybody. But and he, he, he probably learned some of that from his short start in the wild since he did start in the wild. I'm sure even just in the nest, his, he probably learned from his parents. Yeah, that's honestly what I kind of think, too, because everybody else was captive bred, you know, um, so they didn't really have to be paying attention to what was going on around them. So but with him being uh, born outside in, in those wild flocks in California, I'm sure some of that instinctual stuff was a little bit more like ingrained into him or, you know, he learned it from his family and the period of time where he was with a flock um, really that's what's made him be a little bit more cautious of things, probably. <laughs> All right, well, let's dive into the uh, musculoskeletal system. Yeah, so um, today we're, we're going to talk about the musculoskeletal system as we've talked about various other systems in the past. Um, I wanted to go over this particular system. Now, um, I do have a PowerPoint that I'm going to screen share with in just a moment here. Um, I also have some videos that I wanted to show you guys of um, a case that I think is a pretty uh, interesting case to see um, how it how it presented and sort of what we did to help the bird. Um, so let me go ahead here and I'm going to share my screen again. And start from the beginning. Okay. So as we have done with all of our other sort of system talks where we you know talked about the liver and we talked about uh the cardiovascular system the musculoskeletal system is also a system and as i've done with all the other ones i like to talk about anatomy and physiology first because we always have to understand how things work initially um, in order to understand how things go wrong and what we can do to get things back on track. Um, so this is a, a picture that I grabbed of just a sort of generic skeleton of a bird that gives us just kind of the basic anatomy of the, the major bones. Now, there's definitely a lot more depth that we could get into. Like if we took one of these individual bones, let's say that we um, took the femur bone here, there's lots of individual little like portions to that bone, like there's the femoral neck, the femoral head, there's what's called the trochlea and the condyle. So there's lots of individual anatomical parts to a single bone, but that's like really way involved. And I don't want to get into that because that is something that just is very nuanced. Um, so this picture here is just sort of showing us the more general, here's what the major bones look like, um, articulated and all put together on a skeleton of a bird. Um, so what you can see is they've got, you know, their skull. Um, and then we have all these cervical vertebrae. They actually have a fusion of thoracic vertebrae. So whereas a lot of other mammal animals like mammals, you have individual little vertebral bones that basically make the, the spine. Um, birds actually have a lot of fusion of bones. So up in the thoracic region, they have a fusion of bones to make what's called the natarum. And then in the like back part, the lumbar region and the sacral region, they have what's called the syn-sacrum. It's all these bones that are fused together. And that those fusion of those bones in that spine help create stability for that spine. Um, and then branching off of the spine, we have our, our uh, a appendicular skeleton. So we have the humerus and the radius and ulna, which this is very much like a skeleton of another animal, um, of a mammal or, you know, a 
reptile um, that has limbs, not a snake. Uh, so they, there's very similar bones that are conserved across the, the animal kingdom. Now, interestingly, when we look at birds, as we get beyond the radius and ulna, when we go down into the carpus or like the wrist, they have a lot fewer uh, phalanges than um, other animals do. And so we only have a few, we actually only have three little phalange digits and they're kind of just these minor little tiny things. Um, and then when we look at the, the chest area, they actually have this big unique structure called the keel bone. And that keel bone um, is what the muscles attach to from for powering flight. So some birds who are not really well known for flying, have a much smaller keel bone versus those birds that are really well adapted to flying may have kind of a larger, more robust looking keel bone. Um, but that keel bone, it's this big giant thing that a lot of times when you go to the veterinarian, when the veterinarian's feeling over the muscle mass, over the breast, because the breast muscle mass kind of just overlies this area right here, what we're feeling is we're kind of trying to feel for that keel bone. And we should be able to feel it to some extent, but not excessively, because if I can feel the keel bone easier than normal, that means that bird is underweight. Um, but if I can't feel that keel bone or barely feel the keel bone, that means that bird is overweight. Uh, birds will put sort of fat over that area when they are uh, on the heavy side, but then when they are skinny and they are having to utilize body stores of energy, they will actually utilize their own muscle mass and they'll shrink that pectoral muscle mass down and so they can be kind of a little underweight. Now, that pectoral muscle mass can also shrink down um, associated with lack of flying. And that's something that I commonly see in gray, African grays that are older than like they're typically like in sometime in their 20s or maybe in their 30s that haven't been doing any flying. If you don't fly and you're not using the muscles that power flight, then you atrophy those muscles over time. So that uh, saying, if you don't use it, you lose it, uh, definitely applies to birds as well. And so we will have loss of muscle mass over that keel area if they're not doing a lot of flapping flight. Um, as, as they age. And it's just, for some reason, I see it more in African grays than I see it in other species. It absolutely happens in like all different species of birds. I just happen to see it the most in, in the African grays. Um, so that bone is kind of unique to birds and, and interesting. Uh, but the way that that muscle kind of comes across, it actually has branches that kind of go up over here and attach to the forelimb there of the humerus. And so when they're flapping, the muscular contractions that that keel is doing kind of pulls that um, uh, uh, bone down, um, the humerus bone down. And then there's a different muscle underneath that main muscle mass um, called the supracoracoideus bone that like when that one, or supracoracoideus um, muscle that when that one contracts, it makes the wings go up. So there's actually two alternating different um, muscles over that keel that have different functions of uh, helping the wings go down versus helping the wings go up. Um, as we go further along down the body here, they have their femur, which again, very similar to lots of other animals. And then they marked it on this particular anatomical outline as the tibia, but it's really called the tibiotarsis because it's actually a fusion of multiple bones. So that's one of the interesting and unique things about birds is that their skeletal system is, is actually a fusion of a lot of different bones that in mammals may be more unique as individual bones, but birds have kind of fused together. And, and that's all an evolutionary uh, thing that's developed to make them more streamlined and appropriate for flight. Um, this, this foot here uh, is representative of what we see with parrots. Um, it is the what's called zygodactyl foot, um, meaning that there's two toes, two toes pointing forward and two toes pointing back. There is quite a bit of variety of anatomy with birds um, amongst the different groups of what kind of like toe pattern and arrangement they have. But for parrots, since that's who we're mostly talking about today, is um, a zygodactyl foot. Um, and then you can see their cute little tail. They have just this teeny tiny little tail, you know, just a few little coccygeal vertebrae. And then they have this bone called a pygostyle. 
Um, and that's kind of where those feathers for the tail are branching off of is the pygo style. Okay, so that's the anatomy. Here's a couple of other anatomy pictures, but this is trying to represent the physiology because we're talking about the musculoskeletal system. So there's the skeletal system, but then the muscles attached to that skeletal system. And it's really the muscles and the skeletal system working together that allows for body movements. And in fact, there's more than that. The nervous system it has to be involved as well, of course, and we have to pump blood to those muscles. So the cardiovascular system's in, uh, involved as well. So of course, there's much more complexity to this system, but um, for the, the basic understanding, the muscles attach to those bones and those muscles contract to allow for movements. And this picture, the reason I like it, because this is just a picture of the hind limb, but it's showing all the different muscles in their layers. So like this first picture kind of shows a lot of the muscles, but then we take that first couple of layers off and we see that there's more muscles underneath and we take more layers off and see that there's even more muscles and you can take more and more and more layers off and find out just how many muscles there are that are involved. There's not just a single muscle that allows for, you know, contraction and movement. There's muscles working and attaching in different areas so that you can have all that fine motor control and a bone isn't working in just like one plane of movement. It has more of like a three-dimensional ability to, to move around. So again, I like this photo because it really just kind of gives you an idea of that complexity of what, what is going on underneath that skin there, you know? So we're going to now, after going over the anatomy, basic and basic physiology, um, we're going to go over the problems that we commonly see in the office that are coming into a veterinary facility. And um, I have the major ones outlined here. And the reason I put multiple exclamation points behind trauma is because by and far, when it comes to problems with the musculoskeletal system, trauma is the most common presentation for a bird, um, for a problem for the musculoskeletal system to a veterinary office. We certainly see congenital malformations, nutritional problems, hormonal changes that can all result in um, issues, but I just wanted to uh, make sure everybody knows that trauma is really the most common thing that comes into the office, and so we're going to go into all of these. So all right, so when it comes to different types of trauma, um, the most common thing that we have to deal with and the most common thing that people think about is actually fractures to the bones. Um, now, when we have fractures, they can happen for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, maybe there was a bird that like flew into a wall or a window that happens with some frequency. Maybe a bird accidentally got stepped on. That unfortunately does happen with some frequency. Sometimes the birds are walking around, they feel very comfortable with us. We don't see them down there on the floor and accidentally step on them and could cause fracturing to occur. Um, I've also had birds fly um, to a door trying to follow somebody and um, someone was shutting the door and the bird got bird tried to like slip through the door at the last second and got caught in the door and, and fractured itself. I've had birds that have had fractures because they came in when another bird um, bit them, you know, maybe they got in a fight or, or another animal in the home, you know, a cat or a dog. Um, and I will say, I honestly see more dog injuries than I see cat injuries with birds, even though cats are kind of like the um, culprit that a lot of people think about. In reality, the numbers of birds that I see coming into the hospital that have been injured by another animal, um, dogs certainly top the list there, at least for what I see. Um, so, you know, there's there's a variety of ways that, that birds could sustain trauma. Um, so I have some pictures here because when we, when we take an x-ray of a bird to assess the type of fracture that is present. We are doing it for a variety of reasons, but one of the things is we we will name the fractures according to the type of fracture that it is because it allows us to get a little bit better idea of what is the prognosis here and what do we need to do 
for this particular patient? Do we need to manage this patient surgically? Is it going to have a good outcome with surgery? Or does this patient need to be managed medically? It's going to have a better outcome with medical management and bandaging as opposed to surgical management. Having x-rays to help guide us and look at those actual fractures to know which one of those options is better, medical versus surgical, is, is really necessary. Um, so this picture up at the top is what's called a segmental fracture. And the reason we call it a segmental fracture is because you can see this bone. This is the humerus. Uh, it's nice and normal over here, but over here it's broken into three different segments. Um, so that is called a segmental fracture where you have like very large pieces broken into very obvious, like here's segment one, segment two, segment three. Um, as opposed to like this fracture down here, which I don't have a name right next to it other than open, uh, which I'll go over in a second. This would be more of what's called a common nuded fracture. So a common nuded fracture is when there's multiple pieces. You can see this little fissure here and this little fissure over here or that little fissure there. There's, or even this one right in the center. There's multiple fissured pieces that have um, like come off and that is more of a common nuded as opposed to a segmental fracture. Um, now, what you'll notice again is I have this labeled as open. We also look at uh, our injuries and, and see fractures and say, okay, is this an open or a closed wound? An open wound means that bone has poked through the skin and is exposed to the outside world versus a closed fracture is the bone hasn't gone through the skin um, or there's no opening from the outside into the, to the fracture site, everything's, the skin is closed over, which is a little bit better to be dealing with because when it's an open fracture, there's a greater potential for there to be contamination um, and infection. So those carry a poorer prognosis and not that we can't do surgery on them, but there might be a better potential for complications with surgery versus bandaging because of the infectious side of things. Uh, but it very much depends on the individual um, injury that we're dealing with. Um, so we definitely prefer them to be closed. Um, here's an example of a fissure fracture on this side. This one is a full fracture. This is a common nuded fracture. You can see multiple little pieces, but this fissure one, it's called a fissure because it's basically broken through the bone, but it hasn't completely fractured all the way across. We're not in two separate pieces. There's just a little break in there. Of course, that's still going to be quite uncomfortable, but this is going to get we have a better prognosis for healing because it hasn't completely fractured versus this. This is going to have a worse prognosis for healing. Um, and then this fracture over here, this one, this one right here, not this one. Um, actually, that one too. Then I look at it. These are labeled as spiral fractures. Uh, spiral fractures is where the bone kind of like had the way that it fractured wasn't just this like straight across kind of break in half. Um, it broke into two pieces but it has like a sort of spiraling kind of um, ridge, I guess, or edge to the, to the actual fracture itself. Um, so looking at these x-rays as well, the other thing that we will see is you see these bright things in this image here, how we have these really bright white opacities. And then if you look at this image here, there's a bright white opacity, and then there's some really bright opacities here, but they're kind of in little pieces. Um, and even just a tiny bit there, uh, those are actually gunshot wounds. So these two pictures that I have, these are actually of, of wildlife. These are not of um, parrots. This one's actually of a duck. And I believe this one was of an owl. Uh, but these are individuals that have been shot. And I have had parrots come in that have been shot as, as well. Um, so it's not just a wild bird phenomenon, I guess you could say. Um, so something to be aware of um, that, you know, sometimes there is more injury going on than just that fracture that we can that we can see you know this bird has um, you know likely wounds in these other locations where um there isn't any obvious fracture and sometimes with wounds like that like a, a bullet wound going in sometimes they can make a nice like clean entry and, and you may not see too much disruption on the feather so i could potentially miss something if the feathers are really good at covering this area up um, on my physical exam 
take an x-ray, say, oh my gosh, this bird actually has, should have more injuries. And then I can go back to this bird and look closer at those areas to see, is there something more that I need to be addressing there? Is there open wounds there? Can I potentially get some of those little uh, metal bullet fragments out? Um, and also I have to recognize that when I see something like this, um, this bird really should be on some antibiotics because a lot of times when, when a gunshot wound happens, it'll trap like feathers and stuff into the wound itself too. And, and that's potentially quite dirty. Um, they're definitely not sterile. So antibiotics are often necessary for these, these individuals that have these particular types of um, injuries occur. Now, um, as I mentioned, when we have a patient that has a fracture, there's, there's kind of two main ways to deal with um, fractures that happen. Um, and that's either with bandages or it's with um, uh, surgery. And so these are just pictures of birds that are in some bandages or doing some other modeling for us. This bird here has what's called an Altman tape splint. And it's a very, it's a little, it's a little splint and it looks kind of weird because it is medical tape, um, but it's actually a really great splint for small sized birds. So birds that are under like 200 grams in weight, this particular type of split is really what's necessary. And I've, I've had uh, owners sometimes get upset seeing this particular splint on their bird because they think it's not uh, elaborate enough, I guess. Um, but it's really because this is a small bird. This small bird needs a small bandage. We can't put this gigantic bandage on this bird, uh, otherwise we might you know, cause more problems. Here's a different kind of splint. This is called a Robert Jones splint. This is for fractures higher up in the limb. This one's great for the fractures of the tibiotarsus or the tarso metatarsal bone. Uh, this little budgie over here is showing us a little bandage that she has. It's called an interdigital bandage that is covering the foot. So this can be great for uh, injuries that are lower down on the digits. Um, I'll also use these for if there was a uh, bumblefoot, if I have a bird that has um, a bumblefoot lesion, which means inflammation of the foot bottom. And those bumblefoot lesions sometimes go deeper and affect the muscles. And if they're really advanced, the, the most advanced stages, they will affect the skeletal system as well. Uh, this little guy, he had a traumatic injury to one of his toes. Um, so he was in a bench. This is a ball bench that he's in. But because he's a parrot, and parrots are very good at uh, trying to remove any bandages that we put on them because they say, oh, you know, I don't really care for your bandage. Sometimes these birds also have to have cones on to prevent them from, uh, you know, taking their, their bandages. Um, so he's got a, a cone on that's just temporary. This cone is not meant to be on long term. There are Birds that require cones for other reasons that may need to be on for longer periods of time. And those birds that have cones on for longer periods of time, it's kind of nicer for them to have uh, different types of cones that are like the soft ones that, that they can chew apart and are lightweight. But this one is just a temporary thing. So we're using this cone and we put duct tape on it because he was doing a great job of attempting to take it off. And the, the duct tape was providing him with stuff to chew on. You can see chewed all over the edges here. Um, but the, the next picture over, this is a picture of a royal. And he was doing a demonstration of hanging out in a large fish or a small fish tank. And the reason I have this picture is um, because a lot of times when birds have these types of bandages on, they really can't be in a normal cage setup. Um, if they're in a normal cage setup, they are likely going to hurt themselves and, or have a greater potential to hurt themselves. It's not a guarantee, of course. It's just when you've got this gigantic cone on and this bandage on, it's hard to perch and birds naturally want to climb up and they want to perch on, on areas as high as they possibly can. And even if you can remove their perches, some of them just really will use that beak and they're going to climb to the highest corner and just hang themselves in the corner and just sit there, which isn't really what we want them to be doing because they could fall and they could hurt themselves. So keeping them in a small enclosure, and this is a little, this is a little smaller than I would put for a royal. I'd do more like a sterilite tote for a bird his size, but like a budgie would do great in a small, uh, 10 gallon tank uh, that's meant for a fish. You put a towel on the bottom, put some bowls for easy access for their food and water, something to cover the top so they're unlikely to be able to come out. Um, but that is something that's like a hospital cage set up at home that people can do that's just a temporary thing while they're healing with these bandages on. The other thing we can do 
is sometimes they need pins. Um, again, when we have these traumatic injuries, we are either dealing with uh, bandaging or we are dealing with surgery. And so these are all examples of birds that are had fractures that have pins placed. So this one's kind of the nicest image to look at on an x-ray. This image was taken after the, the bandage was in place or the, the pinning was in place. What we did is we went in surgically and we can sew a couple of pictures down here. We're actually inserting a pin into the bone to align those fractured fragments. And you can see the fracture is down here. You can see the little like fissures of pieces of bone, um, but we have, placed a bone, a pin down the bone, uh, connecting both fragments of the, the bone together. And then we placed a couple of extra pins on the outside and we've actually bent this central intramedullary pin to line up with what's called these external fixator pins. And then we put this little connecting bar on the outside, which you can see over here. So this bird has its uh, intramedullary pin and then its external fixator pins. There's another external fixator pin as well. And then we have this connecting bar that's connecting it all together to kind of create this nice rigid stable structure that is going to make it so those bones are aligned well so that they can then heal and these pins are going to come out there's no way that these pins are going to stay in long term um, for the really big birds we have to cut those pins down so i'm using some uh bolt cutters to actually cut some thicker pins down on a larger bird this little this was a little baby um, and you can tell he's a baby on his x-rays if we look at the normal leg over here you can see that there's mineral density to the bone up here and then there's like a black area and then there's mineral density to the bone there that black that black area that's called a growth plate that's actually where the bird is like the bones are growing from and it's still cartilaginous and this this picture it hasn't calcified yet because it'll calcify later when this bird is fully grown and developed um and so this is a, a picture of a young baby unfortunately he had a couple of fractures so um, he had to have a couple of pins in place um and then just a few more pictures. This is an African gray patient that I had several years ago. Her name was Bella. She's a very cute little girl. Um, and here is a picture of her tibiotarsis that has fractured. You can see the normal bone over here. Nice, normal cortex to the bone, all aligned as a single thing. But over here, we actually have a fracture of that tibiotarsis bone. Now the bone has tried to heal itself because all this sort of like fuzzy edge that you can see is the bone trying to come together to, to heal itself. Um, but you can still see that there's these black lines essentially between the bones um, up here and down here that are making it so that bone actually isn't attached. It's trying, that bone was trying really hard to come back together, um, but it just wasn't working. And, and she was originally in a, a little, um, a tape splint, but it just wasn't doing it for her. So we did have to take her to surgery. Um, and we had did the same thing that we did in those other images where we placed an intramedullary pin down the center. And then we had an external fixator pin. She actually had one up here too. You can see the little circle where that pin was placed, but this picture was taken like after she was healing well, the fracture site is down down here. Um, it's hard to see it a little bit in this image because this uh, connecting bar was kind of covering it up a little bit, but things were healing. So we're starting to take down those pins. Um, and this is her connecting bar that you can sort of see on the outside. It really covers up those pins well, so you can't see the pins easily in this image. Uh, this is the tibiotarsis bone. That's the one that was fractured. Um, and she just had a little cone on because again, she's a parrot. I have had parrots take their own pins out. So if a parrot has pins in, it really needs to have a cone on, unless it's a really tiny, tiny bird. But um, anything African gray size or bigger absolutely needs to have something to make it so that it doesn't um, undo our, our surgical attempts earlier than need to be undone. But you can see that um, she's standing and bearing weight on the on that limb there um, with the, the connecting bar sort of visible still here in that image. So she did well, she healed, um, which, was, which was wonderful. Uh, that's always our goal. Okay, so other types of trauma. So I talked about the fractures of the bones, um, but you can also have trauma where it's not fracturing the bone, but it's causing damage to the mus muscular system, right? Because uh, the muscular portion of this musculoskeletal system. Um, and you can have damage to the muscles, but you can also, because the muscles, they're kind of attached to uh, 
tendons kind of at the ends of the, connecting the muscle to the bone. You can have damage to those tendons. And then there's ligaments that are helping join bones together and ligaments can be damaged. So this is a picture of a little bird that had um, a luxation of the stifle joint. Um, and that is the, the knee joint. Um, and you can see how she's, you know, balancing great over here using the right limb just fine, but the left limb is kind of dangling off the side. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment because I'm gonna pop up her video because I want you guys to see what she kind of looked like when she's walking around. So let me just go and find the video real quick. Okay, now I'm gonna come back to sharing my screen. Okay, so hopefully you guys should be seeing that okay. And there she is, she's just in her little incubator here at the office and you can see how she's holding that limb out to the side. Um, we'll watch it again for a moment there. Like initially you can't even see anything's wrong because that leg's kind of hiding underneath her tail. But then as she moves around, see how she has to use her beak as well to like help herself move. She's using her beak as another hand. Uh, but you can see that limb is really rotated off to the side. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing again for just a second and let me go to the images with her. And we'll share again. Oops, from current slide. There we go. Okay, so we had x-rays taken of her, and you can see, if you look at the x-ray here, that's actually where the injury is. So here's the femur bone, and here's the tibiotarsus bone, and you can see they're not lining up on top of one another like they should. In fact, the tibiotarsus bone is off to the side and even displaced a little up from what it should be. Compare it to this side, which is normal. This is the normal joint of the stifle. Um, and then you can see it in this image over here too, the tibiotarsus bone is kind of shifted forward from what it should be. So what we did with her is we took her to surgery and um, we were able to reduce that, well, we opened the joint up um, and the tendon or the ligament there um, was actually damaged. Um, and we realigned, we did a surgery where we actually, uh, we realigned the, the joint to be normal, the way it's supposed to be between the femur and the tibiotarsis. And we, we put um, a certain suture patterning in there that helps to keep it in place. And um, oh, uh, this x-ray here is her post-operative x-ray um, after she had healed. So this was actually uh, beyond post-operative x-ray. This was like after like three weeks. Uh, but you can see now we have that bone in appropriate alignment between the femur and the tibiotarsis. I'm gonna show you her uh, video afterwards. So I'm gonna stop sharing again for a second. Let me get that other video up. And um, <laughs> okay, so this is her. Let me, there's three different videos that I have. So I'm going to get back on sharing screen. Okay, so this was post-operatively. We're holding onto her little foot there and I'm just helping it go through a range of motion. So you can see that it's actually moving pretty normal now. It's in alignment. It's not rotated off to the side the way that it was before. And then here she is in a cage. This is after she was healed pretty well. And see now she just she was able to run across the, the cage nicely. She didn't have to use that beak to help support herself. Um, and then one more video of her. This was her sitting on my hand afterwards. Um, and you can see she's grasping great. Um, and she was quite comfortable and, and doing really well. Um, so she was a kind of nice success story for us there. We were able to help her with that um, luxation that she had and, and get her back to functioning appropriately and normal the way we wanted her to. So. All right, so let me go back into the PowerPoint here. Um, okay, next thing. Uh, other trauma that we will see is just like muscle sprains or strange strains. The same way that you can get a muscle sprain or a strain in the 
person. I mean, that happens with birds too, you know? Um, so it, when that happens, sometimes birds do need to have certain wraps. This bird just had a little wrap on. She was a little uncomfortable, so she was kind of laying down in, in this image here. Um, but she had a wrap on that was sort of supporting her wing in a more normal position because she had a what seemed like a muscle sprain or strain radiographically. There wasn't anything that we could find um, to indicate that she had any um, fractures or luxations or anything like that. And I apologize. I realized I didn't say what a luxation is. A luxation is a dislocation. It's just what we say medically. So, um, apologize that I didn't say that earlier. Um, so we didn't see anything like that with her. Uh, so we were suspecting it was a muscle sprain or strain and she just needed a little support with a bandage to kind of help keep her more comfortable. And then this picture here, this is a different bird. Um, it's a little cockatiel. And what it's showing is we're actually doing laser therapy um, to help it with some issues that it was having. Uh, laser therapy is something that can be really helpful and really nice to enhance the healing process. Um, it helps when we use that laser, uh, when we point it over an area of interest, it improves blood flow to the site, it improves cell turnover, um, and that helps with, you know, uh, essentially speeding that healing process. It works at a cellular level as well to increase energy production. Um, so whenever we have any of these types of injuries, laser therapy can be a component of the supportive care that we do to help these animals feel a lot better and feel, uh, feel less pain. Okay, uh, congenital malformation. So now that we went over trauma, which again was like the most common problem that we see associated with musculoskeletal system for birds coming into the office. Other things that we see is congenital malformations. Now this little, uh, this is a baby peach face love bird. So he looks kind of fuzzy with his feathers and that's because he is a baby. He just has new downy stuff coming out. He doesn't have all his feathers on his head. So he looks kind of goofy, um, but you'll notice that he's got something weird that he is sitting on. And what that actually is, is he was a baby that had splay leg. So sometimes when these young birds are developing, we don't always know exactly what happens, but sometimes their legs will be kind of splayed off in a weird fashion. So sometimes that has to do with um, the substrate that they were on as a baby, like maybe they were on like a slippy, slippery surface and couldn't get their feet tucked underneath them. Um, and since these birds are young and developing and their bones aren't well calcified, if they're kind of splaying them out in weird ways because they weren't able to hold them underneath themselves appropriately, then they may start to calcify and like kind of you know, develop abnormal, ab abnormally. Um, but it can also happen for other reasons. Sometimes the substrate that they're on is totally fine. There's no problems with it, um, but they can have these congenital splay leg problems. And so there's potentially issues with the egg, you know, like while they're developing in the egg, maybe there was some problems with um, the way that that egg was uh, handled or humidity or, you know, something like that, or it could be a genetic thing. You know, maybe the, maybe the parents um, have something genetically that allowed for this to happen. A lot of times it's honestly hard for us to say, but when they have splay leg, what we try to do is we try to retrain those legs to go back into a normal position. So what this little baby has on is, um, it actually has this little foam piece that's kind of gentle and soft against the, the limbs itself. And it's holding those limbs in a normal position. And then we actually uh, have those little toes taped to a skateboard is what we often call it. Um, so that they're also in a normal position. Now these things cannot stay on for a long period of time. They have to be changed because these birds are actively growing. So when we're dealing with these congenital malformations, this is something where every few days they are getting an adjustment of the way that these things are. They may also be getting them off to do a little bit of physical therapy um, to help train those muscles to, to um, have normal functioning. Um, and trying to train the body to keep these limbs in an appropriate configuration so that this bird can walk around normally. And, you know, sometimes we don't get them perfect, um, but they can live okay lives with some slight alterations. So that's something we have to deal with occasionally as well. Okay, uh, nutritional disorders. So this is this is an important one to to talk about because this is something that nutritional disorders we we have some control over being able to deal with these things, um, and it's something that I do believe for 
some of the birds that come in, not all of them, but for some of the birds that come in to the office that are pets that um, may not have the best nutrition and then they have fractures that sometimes those fractures may be happening because the bones were weakened because of some underlying nutritional disorder that was going on. So the picture I have up here uh, to prompt me about this particular talk is um, a little African gray. And it's just a little baby. Um, you can tell how dark those little eyes are. Um, so the reason I have a picture of an African gray is because African grays are one of the birds that people see nutritional problems more in causing low calcium, or at least historically, it's something that we have seen more of a problem in, in the African gray. Um, and if a bird is not getting enough calcium in its diet, um, if it is a mother, it's a, a mother hen that is laying eggs, well, she may not put enough nutrition of calcium into that egg. And a young developing baby in an egg actually pulls, it gets its calcium from the egg shell. Um, and so there's calcium that's mobilized from that egg shell to help their development and their growth. So if the mother may have not been getting enough calcium in her diet, or maybe she wasn't getting enough vitamin D, because we know that vitamin D is really important for birds to make um, well, vitamin D is really important for birds to be able to absorb calcium effectively from their diet. And so if they're not getting vitamin D in their diet from some dietary source, or they are not getting exposed to UV, UV uh, B radiation, whether that be through a uh, sun lamp indoors or through going outside and getting exposure to natural sunlight so that they can make vitamin D, whether they're exposed to natural sunlight or they're having exposure to a um, UVB lamp indoors. Both of those things will allow them to make vitamin D on their own. If they make vitamin D on their own, then they're going to be more effective at absorbing calcium from their diet. When they absorb calcium effectively, it's important for various functions the skeletal system, it's important for um, the muscle system because muscles contract and they need calcium to contract appropriately. Um, it's important for the nervous system as well. If you don't have enough calcium, calcium is important in the nervous system for certain like nerve signaling essentially between nerves um, and so, or amongst the nerve. Um, so if you don't have calcium, then skeletal system, muscle system, nervous system may not function well. And if that's especially happening in a young bird where they didn't get enough calcium um, from you know, the parent, they may have been set up wrong to begin with. And then if they're not getting appropriate nutrition um, during development, then they could have poor calcification of their bones, which then can make them uh, those bones weaker and thus more likely to fracture if you know they injure themselves in a very mild way where they would normally be able to sustain an impact and not have any problems, they may have themselves uh, develop a fracture because of just really poor, weak bones. Um, and this image over here, this is an x-ray, you can see a, a fracture um, on this humerus and it actually kind of healed together abnormally. Uh, but this was a bird that had historically had um, a poor diet um, and you actually can see, see this bright thing here? That's actually one of those uh, extra medullary pins that was present in a uh, fracture of the femur. So the bone lower down was fractured and we were dealing with that. But this x-ray revealed to us that this bird had already previously had a fracture and this bone doesn't look healthy. Like it doesn't look nice and smooth with the cortices. It looks very irregular. Um, so this bird had presented because it had not its first fracture, but at least its second fracture. This one was old and we don't even know exactly when that fracture happened. But on questioning with the, the owners with this particular bird, we were able to identify that this bird didn't have the best diet. And that probably was a contributing factor to this bird having um, multiple fractures at different points in its life. So not only do we have to deal with the fracture, I have to you know, make sure that this bird is, has appropriate um, either medical or surgical management for the fracture, but then 
Also, I need to make sure it has appropriate pain control. So while it's healing, I also have to fix the diet. I also have to work with the owners to say, okay, what can we do to make this bird's diet better so that this doesn't continue again? Maybe we have a third fracture or fourth fracture down the line because that can happen. If, if we continue to have a poor diet, then absolutely we could have um, multiple fractures happen again down the road. So we'd like to avoid that. So. All right, hormonal changes. That was the next thing that I wanted to um, discuss uh, because this is something that we do see as well with some frequency causing issues with the musculoskeletal system. Um, as we've talked about hormones in the past many times because hormones are such a common problem that we are having to deal with in, in various birds. Um, and they can cause problems in various ways, but one of the ways that they can cause problems is through uh, issues with the musculoskeletal system. Now, this x-ray actually doesn't show any problems with the, the musculoskeletal system, but it does show something that tells me this bird is hormonal. And so um, what I can see on this x-ray and what I'm gonna point out to you guys is, um, maybe let's go back really quick. I'm gonna go back to one of the other x-rays that we had that um, showed uh, a non-hormonal bird. So I'm going to flip back real quick. We're going to go to this one. Okay. So when you look at this x-ray, what you can see on a bone is you should be able to see this very bright white outer edge to the bone. That's the cortex. And then this darker center to the bone, that's the medulla um, or medullary cavity, however you like to say it. And if you notice, if you look at this bird, we've got that kind of pretty consistently amongst all these different bones here. It, it's There's muscle mass that's kind of overlying it, sometimes it makes it a little less um, dark down the center in that medullary cavity. And this particular bone is called, uh, well, the humerus is a pneumatic bone. So it actually has like an air sac that goes down into it. Whereas this bone here, the ulna and then the radius, those are not pneumatic bones. So they actually don't have air sacs going down in them. So they look a little darker, but you can still see the difference between this outer bright edge is the cortex and the like darker center is the medullary cavity. You can see the difference between there. Now keep that in mind if we're gonna go back to that x-ray of the hormonal bird. Notice how on this ulna here, you don't really notice a difference between the cortex and the medullary space. Like there's some, there's some dark little spots in the medullary space, but you also have these really bright white spots in that medullary space all the way down to the end. You can't see the cortex as, as crisply defined. Now in this bone you can, again that's the humerus and it has that air sac going down it. You can see the difference between the cortex and the medul medullary cavity. But look at this femur here. This femur, like I can't tell the difference between the cortex and the medullary cavity. It's very hard. It's just like all whited out. Same thing down here with the tibiotarsal bone. Again, all like whited out other than maybe up at the top a little bit. You can see a little bit of that medullary cavity, but not much. Um, Th that really bright white center that makes it so you can't see a contrasting difference between the cortex and the medullary cavity. That is because estrogen is stimulating um, breakdown of that, uh, of the, um, what's called osteoblasts, which are the bone cells that are present in the bone um, and allowing them to release calcium. So this bird is actually releasing more calcium into circulation. It's getting it into the medullary cavity. The medullary cavity is directly connected with the vascular system. So it's getting more blood uh, that has high calcium into the vascular system. Um, and they're getting their calcium levels higher so that they can send calcium to the reproductive tract so that they can do all the normal reproductive functioning and cycling that is, is occurring. Um, you know, that calcium is important for um, various points in that, that reproductive physiology, you know, making the shell of the egg is the very obvious one that everybody knows about, but it's also important for normal uterine contractions and other things going on as well. And so the, the body is pulling a lot of calcium stores to send to the reproductive tract when they are hormonal. So this is a normal physiological thing to happen. And when I see this on an x-ray, I go, aha, this bird is hormonal. Um, now, it could potentially be indicative of problem and, and, and in two ways. One is um, if you have a bird that's just constantly, constantly hormonal and it's constantly pulling calcium from its own bony stores, then what we worry about is 
they're going to start depleting their calcium. They're going to make their bones more brittle. They are going to be more likely to fracture. So it goes back to the same thing as the nutritional causes. Uh, when we have low calcium levels, same exact thing is going to start happening here. If they keep laying eggs and keep using all their calcium, so those bones are going to be weaker and have a greater potential to fracture. The other thing um, that when I look at this on an x-ray that can indicate that there's a problem is if I see this in a male, male birds really shouldn't have any major estrogen. And if I see this, that tells me that there is estrogen circulating and causing breakdown of the, the osteoblasts. Um, and that will happen in certain tumors that male birds can get of the testicles. Um, and so we'll see that with what's called seminomas and Sertoli cell tumors. So two very specific tumor types that can happen in, in male birds will secrete estrogen. Estrogen then causes breakdown of the bones. And I can see that on an x-ray. If I see that, if I see this on an x-ray in a male bird, I'm pretty concerned that I've got something quite a bit more serious going on that we need to be uh, managing for them. So, um, so yeah, that's, that, those are the things that I think about when I see those particular changes on an x-ray. All right, that was actually the last um, that I had for the last picture that I had for my slideshow there. Um, so at this point now, um, I know we're pretty close to the the end here. I know I didn't really leave much time at all looking at looking at a clock here. I didn't really leave it, much time. It looks at like all. we we just have a couple of questions, so maybe we can okay. get. To, um, Leslie was asking, how much pain do the birds experience during the post surgery recovery from fractures, and what do you do to address their discomfort? Yeah. So absolutely, we for sure give them pain medications because we have to imagine that these these have to be uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, it's something that it's it has, putting a level of how much pain do they actually feel is hard for me to do because birds are really stoic about showing signs of discomfort. But one has to imagine that if they had their own bone fractured, they would absolutely want some pain meds. So we, we know we have to do it for them too. And they may show more subtle signs like they may not eat well, or they may just be really quiet or not vocalizing. Um, those are the things that may be indications for pain in them, which seem really subtle and like, not like it's, you know, they're not screaming out or anything like that. I have to say most of the time birds are not screaming out in pain they're often usually more quiet um so for those birds we are usually doing things like non anti-inflammatories like meloxicam we're doing opiates like um buprenorphine or uh buprenorphinol or um sometimes tramadol we're doing things like gabapentin we're doing laser therapy because that helps with pain um so there there's multimodal pain management that we do for these guys and it kind of depends on the individual bird Okay, and then uh, Nan was asking if you could advise on the best type of UV light to get. Yeah, um, so, you know, there's a variety of UV lights out on the market, and honestly, they're kind of more marketed towards the reptiles. Um, so there is the, the bird uh, one that's called Avisun, but it's honestly the same thing as the Repti Sun um, 5.0. When, you, when you're looking at a UV light, um, no matter kind of what the brand is, what you want to do is you want to look on the labeling of that packaging or the little package insert. There should be a little graph that's in there or on the box in some way. And there's a, that graph, it'll show numbers at the bottom that are in nanometers. And there's going to be like a little peak that happens. And you should be seeing a peak at the 280 to 320 nanometer range. But the whole graph is going to run from like 200 to like 600 nanometers. And so you need a little peak in that 280 to 320 nanometer range to say that that one is appropriately emitting UVB radiation. Okay, well, with that, we actually are out of time now. Um, we're gonna do our, our giveaway real quick. And that is going to be in a con, uh, continuing to celebrate our 50th anniversary for our pellets, um, a bag of pellets and another bag of Lefebvre product of choice. And that's going to Gloria Shrek. Um, so um, Gloria, we'll contact you next week about your prizes. And thank you, Dr. Lamb, so much. Um, next week, we've got Lisa Bono. And I believe she's talking about visit to the avian, uh, how, how to prepare your bird for going to the vet. 
So that should be interesting and certainly something that's going to help out um, your veterinarian, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, so we're definitely looking forward to uh, Lisa's presentation. And then at the end of the month, we'll have Dr. Tully back. Um, hopefully he's, he's um, reviewed all of his um, master's thesis that he was having to do. And um, with that, um, let's see, Laura would say all the best to you and your flock. Um, I'm going to say, hey, let's get the flock out of here. <laughs> so everybody have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you next time. All right. Bye. Bye.